another episode of RPM, the Red Peace Machine. I'm Susie Sheeler, and we are here with several other hosts that will always be with us. And I would like very much for them to uh, say hello to you and also to give us a little check-in on how you, you've been doing this weekend and Christmas, et cetera. Mr. Peace, Roy Peace, would you like to start? Sure. Hey, how's it going, folks? Uh, my name is Roy. Uh, yeah, pretty good, pretty good week. Uh, you know, just relaxed with the kids. I uh, was off from work. Uh, finally <laughs> seems like I've been like doing a bunch of stuff at work but like off and then just hang out with the kids uh, we didn't do much we start picked up skateboarding <laughs> so that's been fun and then uh yeah other than that let's go ahead uh Roy War you want to take this <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, we went camping and that was a lot of fun uh we were in Terlingua in the desert trying to detox a little bit um mm -hmm. I am shocked every time we go how few people in Junction, Texas, wear masks. Uh, mm -hmm. just, just a ding Junction. Anyway, uh, let me turn it over to Ramesh. Hey, y'all. I'm Ramesh. Uh, he, him, they, them pronouns once again. Um, Christmas has been interesting here since I'm so removed from like the United States and all the Christmasings going on there. Wait, where are a you, really Ramesh? Interesting... Yeah, oh, I'm in Pakistan. You? Still in Pakistan. Live from Pakistan. Uh -huh. In the field. <laughs> in the field, foreign Can reporter. Go to, go to Ramesh now. <laughs> <laughs> live from the scene. Yeah. <laughs> Do y'all have that awkward delay, like the, the, the like three and a half second pause where <laughs> the foreign Pakistan, correspondent three and a half light seconds away. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that problem. Why do they? I don't know. It's kind of weird, right? <laughs> but Nefsha, uh, can figure it out. They can't figure it out. What? But Nefsha, how are you? Wait, Ramesh, are you done? Thank you. Susan. Oh, I, I have a Christmas story, but I can. Yes. I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself first. Oh yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. I, but I got stories too. Go. Just go. Ooh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I was. I was at. Um, the mall, masked and everything, of course. There's temperature checks as you walk in, all that going on. And uh, the mall is a, you know, a place you go if you're like a Western aspiring, like upper, upper middle class person here, all of that kind of stuff. You're shopping at certain brands. It's a whole different environment than the, the average market or whatever else. And here on the third floor, I'm waiting on someone and I'm like in the little, the central atrium area where the escalators are going up and down, all of that's going on. And I all of a sudden hear like a piano coming from the uh, first floor, the ground floor. And the pian pianist is playing jingle bells, this little melody jingle bells. And in Pakistan, where the population is at minimum, you know, 90, 95% Muslim, there's a very small Christian minority. All of this, and he's playing jingle bells, and the mall is decorated, Christmas lights, all of this is everywhere. There are Christmas sales going on, and he's playing jingle bells. And it's really strange for me because the average encounter that someone in Islamabad would have with someone who is Christian is with the uh, the class of people who have four generations been sort of sweeping their homes, mopping their floors, uh, taking out their garbage, doing all of that kind of work. And these are the same people who would, you know, never in a million thousand years be allowed to enter the same mall. And so it's really strange that simultaneously this this symbol of Jingle Bells becomes a like an aspiration to like some kind of um, Western ideal of like this foreign sort of celebration of Christian of Christmas and how removed that is from the actual uh, lives of actual Christian folks here who are, you know, at best sweeping in the mall. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really strange to have Jingle Bells function in that kind of way. I was like, what, what are folks here aspiring towards? What's going on with, with Jingle Bells taking place here? But for me, it was also really nice because it, it got to feel like Christmas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dang. That is that must have been surreal, quite frankly. I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I pulled out my phone and I was like, oh my goodness, I've got to record this. This is so strange. That like what 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 is jingle bells being played on piano to this group of folks here in the Yeah, world? what does it mean? Yeah. Uh -huh. Interesting. yeah, that's a really good question. I'm I mean, I wonder if we could follow that up in two years and see where it is. Might be interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. Banasha, your turn. Okay. Um yeah, hey, uh, I'm Banafse. Let's see. Um, yeah, we went to Terlingua, and uh, this was our second time in three weeks going to Terlingua. We went there for Thanksgiving, too. too. And uh, by the way, I watched the 
half I'm halfway through the the documentary that you suggested. It's pretty interesting. So I I had a totally new eye as I was going. <clears throat> it was it was uh, yeah it was a little different. Um. Yeah, if we we hung around with um, another family, mask, distance, all of that, but it was mm -hmm. nice to have them around too. Um, yeah, it was good. It was good. Um, yeah. Another thing that's been going on with me is parenting. <sighs> Being a mother. Being a mother is hard. <clears throat> It's really hard. Yeah, especially at the holidays, right? And you've had, have you had the kids home this entire time? The kids have been home for months. <laughs> Since COVID. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, some kids are back at school. Yeah. No, they're not. And um, yesterday they went off on me for, um, we're trying to get them to be more outside. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I've, <sighs> This was the second time I did that, and I knew that it was the wrong thing to do. I just, a lot of ideas and energy. Like trying yeah. to keep them outside, I lock them out. And they were so, I know, they were so I upset. I feel like you're sharing that. too much. I, I'm stopping the program. <laughs> uh, Where's my phone? I, I, I don't feel comfortable sharing. C CPS, hello. And, and we beat the fuck out of them too. We peed all over them. It was amazing. Really? Fuck. You really peed on our children? <laughs> wow. Where was I? Are you telling me now, live? <laughs> uh, oh, I've, Lord. I've okay. done the same thing with Abdullah twice at some point in time. It was like last year during the summer or something. I, I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah. Him him not wanting to go outside, not wanting to engage with, with other folks. And then after COVID being much more socially anxious than he had you know ever been before that point yeah and it yeah, was really frightening and weird to see that transformation over months and to have that hit me in one moment where i was like wow you're, he was uh, you know frightened of walking out of the door and having other people outside mm -hmm. it must and, be just yeah what are the fine for yeah no, as a child a, like how do you make sense of i don't know yeah i don't yeah. i don't know how much of this is being afraid are we still recording or did you really stop it? i think this is real no, stuff, just, honestly. He's kidding. <laughs> what, did I mean, I, I didn't stop it. Oh, okay, great. Why, why are you angry? I want to do a new show, not not what the fuck's wrong with my family. <laughs> well, I mean, this is our life, you know. <laughs> Fuck our lives. They're worthless. We're fucking upper middle class assholes with all this privilege, and all we do is whine and cry. Now, that is not true. We whine and cry to a very large audience. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that all of this is very real for everyone who has kids, quite frankly. I think they're going nuts. I, I can't imagine having to deal with children right now. It's pretty much why I decided not to have them, because I don't think I'm good at it. Um, oh, no. no, but hey, Susie, when you get them, yeah. Nobody yeah, does. when you get, I mean, I didn't want kids. When you get them, I mean, yeah, things change and you just, oh, well, okay. I have this, you want to oh. talk about sharing. I've had a hysterectomy. <laughs> so, so have I. <laughs> yay! Party on, girl. Wasn't that the best decision you ever made? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yes, actually. Yes. <laughs> no more periods. No more periods. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about, um, we, ha we are going to move forward and we're going to continue to move forward in our direction of storytelling. Um, and the, the story we want to tell today, Roy has for us. Um, and then we'd like to uh, kind of use it as a backdrop for what's going on now, especially in India. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, as Joan Didion said, getting it in, <laughs> we tell our story so that we may live. Roy, will you tell us a story? Absolutely. So actually, um, there's a tradition that we have in, on earth where occasionally farmers go into a state of uprising. Uh, the Bowen Krieg, which took place in 1524, of course, uh, I think <clears throat> sort of establishes a tradition of revolutions in Europe that will, uh, you know, ultimately lead to uh, major transformations in, in European society from a feudal society into a modern society. Having said that, 
one of the revolutions that the world kind of ignores and doesn't pay anywhere near enough attention to is the Haitian Revolution, uh, which started in 1791. And um, <clears throat> it piggybacks right off of the French Revolution. So the, the French Revolution happened in three phases. The first phase takes place in 1789, and it's a bourgeois uprising. And the reason why the bourgeoisie is, is rising up against the French monarchy is because <clears throat> uh, trade is inefficient. Um, each, each province has its own currency, its own tax code, its own set of tariffs. And so to send a set of goods from one end of France to the other end of France, ends up costing the merchant class so much money in tariffs and trading and changing uh, currency and they have different weights and measures. It's a nightmare. And so they basically go into a state of rebellion against the monarch. Two years later, the Haitians hear that France has gone into a revolution, the Haitian slaves, and they go into an uprising as well. And then it's two years after that, that the French people joined the French Revolution. So the French people don't really join the French Revolution until 1792, 1793, <laughs> which is really amazing when you think about it because sequentially, one of the reasons why the French people joined the French Revolution is because they hear that the slaves in Haiti have, have joined the revolution. And they're like, well, if the slaves can do it, surely we can. And, and then of course, that phase of the revolution lasts really until uh, the Napoleonic War starts. So Haiti was a particularly brutal um, French colony. San Dominique is what the French called it at the time. It uh, had a population of about 550,000 people. It was about 20,000 whites. About so I'm sorry, is this when, <clears throat> when you say it was La Dominique, does that mean uh, or Saint Dominique? Is that what you said they called it? Saint Dominique. So Saint Santo Domin Domingo was what the Spanish call their, their part of the island, which is about right. by land, I think about 70% of the island. So uh, the is island, that, when, when did they split Haiti and why? Uh, so the island's original name was actually Haiti. Okay. Uh, it was populated by the Arawaks. When Columbus arrived, he renamed it Hispaniola. And then the Spanish renamed it Santo Domingo. And then the French, uh, when the, when, as Spain started to go into decline, the Spanish Empire started to lose power. The French and the English were eager to grab islands in the Caribbean. And the French managed to cleave off the Western 30%, 25% of the island um, to make a, basically a giant sugar slave plantation. Um, Thank you. I don't know the year the French did that. Uh, but then they named it San Dominique okay. because of Santo Domingo. And then today, the island is Hispaniola. That's its official name. The eastern end is the Dominican Republic, and the Re Dominican Republic after uh, Sa Santo Domingo. And then the, mm -hmm. the, the black-ruled part is called Haiti in reference to Haiti, the original name. So all okay. three names exist today in some form. Wow. Okay, I'm sorry to have interrupted. I just oh, no, wasn't no. sure how that Always had happened. interrupt me. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll just go off. <laughs> okay, so you were telling the story about yeah. how the French, that's how they joined the Fr French Revolution. Well, so, so the population of the island was about 20,000 whites and about 30,000 mulattoes. Um, it, unlike the United States, where <clears throat> if you were part black, you were all black, right? So there were, there were plenty, thousands of, part white black slaves in the United States. In France, if you were part white, you could not be enslaved. So th th that's why there was this, this important distinction of what a mulatto was, because they were, they were basically like second class French people. They, they could not be enslaved. They had the rights of a French person to a, to a large extent, to the point where actually a huge number of them were plantation owners who owned slaves, ironically. Wow. And then there were about 500,000 slaves. And France's philosophy was, if you let the slave population acclimate, they would, they would learn French, they would learn the geography, they would learn the lay of the land. And since the slaves outnumber the free people 10 to one, you're risking a slave rebellion. So the French philosophy was work the slaves to death. Um, and, I've seen some estimates where at one point the slave population on ha Haiti on San, San Dominique had a life expectancy of about two years. 
you, oh, you got off the ship and they literally just worked you to death. <clears throat> oh, wow. Um, in the midst of all of this terrible, maniacal suffering, word gets around that there's been a revolution in France. The slaves, of course, don't understand that it's just a bourgeois revolution. It has nothing to do with anybody getting liberty. It's just to improve finance. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> they, they go into a state of uprising. I think it was June or July, 1791. It was early summer. And at first it's extraordinarily violent. Um, the slaves are <clears throat> taking out vengeance on their white masters. They're murdering people all over the place. And it, it from, from, you know, like <clears throat> the outside, it just looks horrific. Toussaint Louverture was in his fifties. He had beat the odds. He was an older man. Um, <clears throat> he, he's described as having uh, salt and pepper hair. And he was really admired by the slaves that, that were on the plantation, but also the master. And the master uh, turned to Toussaint and said, can you hold down the fort? I need you to protect my family. Keep running the plantation. I'm gonna go help put down a slave uprising that's nearby. And he left Toussaint in charge and actually went, put down the slave uprising and came back. And, and what Toussaint was doing was he was trying to figure out how he fit into the revolution. And finally, in August, he figures it out. And he starts organizing uh, slaves. They create an army pretty quickly. He's an extremely charismatic leader. And one of the things that he begins to do is uh, take out the violent leadership from the slave uprising. There was one man in particular who had... Uh, murdered a baby, when Toussaint found out about it, he attacked that guy's forces, captured that guy and executed him. And he said, we're not doing any vengeance killing, we're not doing anything like that. We're, we're simply gonna liberate the, the slave population without the need for any excess of bloodshed. And he does. Um, he captures the French colony and he tells the white population, look, we don't, we don't know math. We don't know how to balance the checkbooks. We don't know accounting. You guys need to continue to run the plantations, but you have to pay us now. We get our fair share of the labor. So we're not slaves anymore. You can't whip us anymore. There's no beating anymore. You're not gonna work us to death anymore. That's done. But we're gonna continue to grow the, the sugar. You're gonna do the math and the economic side of things. You're gonna be the managers. If, if one of us is lazy, you bring them to my attention and I will punish them. We will not have anybody lazy, but at the same time, we're not, we're not doing any of this slavery stuff anymore. And um, <clears throat> in the process, he also then establishes um, <clears throat> this, this idea that the, Haiti will remain in the French empire. It will, it will be Catholic. French will be its official language. Um, he, he's against voodoo or any any type of African influence on the religion. He wants to keep Haiti in France. That He makes it very clear. It's just there's no more slavery. And, that, and they start to run the colony very successfully. The money is flowing, the sugar is flowing. And then uh, Britain and Spain decide to work together to co-conquer the colony because it's now the Napoleonic Wars. It's a few years later and Napoleonic Wars have kicked in. And uh, Toussaint and his former slave army successfully defeat Spain and Britain simultaneously. Wow. Destroy their, their armies. It's incredible. Well, so they were upset because um, they didn't know the math and they were used to getting a price for their yield, a normal price for their yield. And now... They said, we want to run the plantations, but we don't know how to do A, B, and C. Um, so that kind of sounds to me like what's happening in India, unless I'm way off on that. Uh, they're being told that you guys now deal with the, the people who are in charge, who buy stuff, and we're going to step back and we're not paying you anymore. Uh, you guys are in charge of all that, but they don't know how to do that because they've never dealt directly one-on-one. -on -one. Am I wrong about that? That's, that's the way I'm understanding it. And, it, and that's why there's a revolution there, the farmer uprising, like, like Haiti, let's say. But 
I don't think there's a lot of blood going on. I think they're just blocking the roadways. Ramesh? Yeah, so I, I don't think there's a lot of blood going on. These are general strikes. And I think one of the really interesting things about like this particular set of strikes against this particular government is that they're actually like at the table and negotiating. The, the, the sort of recurring common like regular tactic of this government in response to these strikes has been to like cast the like the protesting party as this like fundamental other outside of the nation, treacherous, uh, foreign, terrorist, all of that stuff. And that works when they're Muslims, that works when they're like Dalit, that works when they're all sorts of other categories, but for some reason that isn't working when they're farmers. And so they're actually at the table and they're actually having negotiations and, you know, farmers have, have blocked roadways, have done all of that and are still sitting out in the cold in the winter uh, and negotiations are happening. That's great. Like where are, do you know, do you have updates as to where that negotiation is? I mean, how does that work? Are they trying to teach them to do the math or is that part of it? I mean, that would seem the only logical thing to do is to teach them how to do it themselves and then, and then move on. But they're going to go for a while without money, I would assume. I, I'm a little like uh, confused and trying to catch up on um, what you mean when you say uh, doing the math is or how you're understanding Well, we were talking about how the Haitians couldn't understand, they could grow stuff, but they couldn't sell it. Uh, they didn't know how to balance the checkbooks. And then, so it seems to me like that might be a fear that the Indian farmers have right now, because they're used to getting that, that money directly from the government, right? Um, it's a base price for each yield. Um, and now they're not getting that anymore. Or that's, that's the issue, is that they won't be getting that base price anymore. Hmm. They have to haggle with the vendors themselves or the mm -hmm. procurers. Yeah, and I think that opens them up to like all of these sort of market pressures and like neoliberalization of agriculture, which is really, really scary. How does farming continue to take place if like in the same way that other sectors in India have been opened up, other kinds of neoliberalizations have happened in India, if that same thing comes to uh, farming and agriculture. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you have large corporate financial interests with all sorts of power and money and influence and like a, a bigger seat at the table, a bigger ability to negotiate than those uh, individual small scale farmers have. Yeah. I just want <clears throat> to chime in for just a second. I like um, how, how we're connecting the Haitian story to the Indian story right now. Um, I, I'm kind of feeling a little uneasy about it, so I'll just put it out there. Um, uh, I, I think it's a really good uh, comparison. I just want to say that, you know, uh, that was an enslaved population. Um, good point. That was, <laughs> and the situation was... Um, yeah, and this is kind of a different situation. It's just putting it out there just for um No, it makes a difference. Clarity. Yeah. yeah. Like um I just I just feel like it's um yeah. I guess it's still a caste system is the is <clears throat> is the the connection, I guess. But you know, you know, I guess I mean that's kind yeah, of how, yeah. I, how I connect it is you've got slaves or you've got a lower caste and you may have more freedoms, but you're still in the lower caste, you know, uh, in, in different, unless I, I again, I don't fucking know. <laughs> no, well, but I'm there's, there's something, yeah. yeah, interesting happening because the, these sort of current movement is really interesting in that it's like cross those kind of caste and land uh, lines, right? So you have like wealthy farmers who own land and who employ peasantry on their land in like quasi feudal ish systems who are in active alliance with those same peasants who work on that land, that poor peasantry, uh, in alliance with these, uh, or coalition with these sort of uh, middle class farmers as well. These, so like landowners and this peasantry is, are at the, the you know, are, are both participating in these protests in a kind of coalition. So it's, it, it, in a weird way, it is cross caste. Wow. There's also, an, I think, a, an interesting similarity that most people probably don't realize which is that 
in a strange way, um, places like Haiti were sort of early social networking sites because the, the, the slave population was packed together when they worked, they were packed together when they uh, were sleeping, when they were in, in their homes. And as a result, there was, there was actually a lot of communication that I think you wouldn't have seen in a normal farm setting from 240 years ago, you would, or 230 years ago. It would have been you know, much more isolated population. And so in, in a really weird way, the fact that the Haitians had the ability to talk to each other because they were in close contact with each other, um, but were also at the same time from different parts of Africa and as a result had ran into language barriers, they ran into uh, cultural differences, and then of course in a, in a really amazing way, that's what's happening in India, right, because India has so many different languages and so many different cultures. And so there's, there's, there's this really interesting correlation in the sense that financially, they're in a similar situation, but um, but but there are weird parallels that float through it. Well, I guess that's just the nature of revolution. <laughs> I mean, they were all going to have some kind of parallel, I guess, because I mean, people get beaten down. Do you think something like that would ever happen here? Um, you know, our farmers are so upset and. Uh, we bail them out constantly because we have so much excess, I guess, and our our government is the one who bails them out. We have all these bailouts, right? But we're not socialists, which I don't understand at all. We we prop up all of these businesses, banks go under, and we pay to have them built back up, and then they don't give us a break on our mortgages or anything. But I'm wondering, um, you know, when when people are oppressed like that and I got to tell you, I really know very little about oppression. I, that's, you know, I'm a white woman. I, there's not a lot of oppression. But I, I do study the revolutions, especially the French, French one. And I wonder if we could ever get to that point where our farmers were saying, if we made a switch like that, if, you know, we refuse to bail them out anymore, what would happen? Do you think they would rise up or do you think they'd just take it? We're a very different country. I think I feel like they just take it. I mean, I agree with you. Uh, so first of all, we have a caste system in the United States. Uh, the, the, one of the fun things about talking about India is when you, once you bring up caste, it's like, oh, people are locked in. And yet we do the exact same thing in the United States. We just, we just pretend we don't, right? Like look up right. your favorite politician. I, there's a high probability that that politician had a politician ancestor. Look up your favorite Hollywood actor. All of the current yeah. current Hollywood exactly actors right. are second, third generation Hollywood actors. Presidential dynasties. Pres it, it, and it goes all the way through, including the farmer class, right? The vast majority of the farmers in the United States, were their families were farmers. We've right. been having a pretty catastrophic um, farm disruptions in the United States since the 1970s, really since Jimmy Carter. Um, mm -hmm. it's not that there weren't farm disruptions prior to that, there definitely were, but it's been sort of like this consistent bad four and a half decades. And, um, one of the driving forces, one of the driving forces behind this ha has been, in fact, uh, the way the U S operates with its subsidies and the way it pays farmers to originally not grow food, right? The original subsidies that we put into place after World War II were designed to convince a section of the farming population to take a check, which would then reduce the amount of food available, which would then increase the price. And so it was an attempt to, at price manipulation. And then Carter came along and he said, this is, this is insane. We could be producing all this food. We could feed the world. What we need to do is do a subsidy not not to discourage production, but to encourage production. So instead we'll do like Europe does, which is they, they pay the farmers the difference between the price they're getting at the marketplace and what they should be getting to make a profit. And he did this with corn and soy and the effect actually ended up being cataclysmic because what ended up happening was farmers had to that, farmers sold off their cattle and created feedlots because they realized that by doing this, they could, um, get the subsidy when they fed the cattle, right? Because if you, if you don't sell the, the, the soy or the corn, you don't get the subsidy. 
And, right. and, and then the, the end result was they had to, because you don't have cows on your farms anymore, you have to buy fertilizer and they took out all these loans. And the long story short is that American family farmers were decimated to the point where in the 80s we had uh, one of those concerts for Ethiopia. Yeah. We did it for farmers. Yes, right? yes, we and, are the world or something, or farm and, aid and, or and then, and then, of course, Trump has reinstituted a Depression-era farm subsidy that was created in the Great Depression to, to help out farmers because of the tariffs that he created that then uh, disrupted the, the, the ability to sell our food, our pork, and our soy, especially to China. The, the long story is that what's happened over the last four and a half decades is slowly but surely corporations have taken over our farms and they'll hire the same farmer family right back to work on the farm that used to be theirs but they but now they're peasants right they're 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 not they don't own the land i mean that's the definition of a peasant right a person who works on a farm who doesn't own the land and is basically paid something to, to, to produce um and so what we've done in the united states is we've peasantized the farm farmer class cast cast yeah it's yeah. a cast well uh so th another thing i was reading about the india uh, uprising is that this new law these new laws that are going into place will allow the people who purchase the goods the yields um can hoard them and that's never been allowed so that they can later sell them at a much higher price and that has never been allowed over there, as far as I can understand from what I've been reading. And now, uh, you know, great big companies can come in, do a deal with these farmers, take all of their stuff and just save it for when people need it and sell it at a very high price. Is that what you, Ramesh, is that, am I anywhere close to that? Yeah, I, I'm not as familiar with that, but I think it's it's really interesting to see those same sort of parallels of this kind of like push towards uh, mass farming, not mass farming, I guess, corporatized farming and like industrialization of farming, right? So like farming sector in India is really unproductive, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and there's a lot of room for corporations to come in and do the same kind of work they did with farming in the United States. I, I kind of read it as part of like a broader trend towards neoliberalization, towards industrialization since like the 80s in India when India turned away from a social, a more socialist sort of orientation. And yeah, Roy, one thing I'm really curious about are, is, are, are there any kind of like, I, I'm really fascinated by the fact that this, this BJP government has faced uh, repeated sort of uprisings, movements, uh, protests uh, from various sort of sectors of society, but like each have been relatively unsuccessful. Um, this seems to be successful because of that broad coalition of, of peasantry, who is peasantry because they don't own the land, but are wealthier in addition to like those sort of caste oppressed uh, other peasants, uh, in addition to like some land, smaller and medium sized landowners, things like that. Are there any historically like successful examples of an uprising or a rebellion or a protest movement that like truly came from the bottom of the bottom and was not like a broader coalition of more powerful folk? Or hmm. <laughs> Iranian revolution. Um, but before Same we way. go there, I, I there is something interesting. Um, so uh, this this when we're talking about to, uh, the uh, the Haiti um, example, um, and also just now with the the Indian example of the farmers. Um, this concept of productivity and the very fact that the the notion of laziness was brought up was part of the discussion as Roy was telling the story that some person somewhere um, had the thought to bring up the fact that these enslaved people <laughs> at some point were lazy and that we will... <laughs> We and did yeah, the same we, thing. Oh, for sure. Which is the second thing I was going to say that uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm finding it interesting that we're, we're not bringing the enslaved by being in the South right now. If we did, we're not bringing yeah. up uh, the, the enslaved population, the history of the enslaved population here in the mainland uh, U.S. is interesting too. But just this notion of productivity mm -hmm. 
and how it needs to be policed, even for farmers who live this sort of yeah. agrarian um, lifestyle that, you know, is cycled and they have to take time off. And it's just all really interesting how this is, this is coming yeah. up and how the neoliberal machine is based. One of the things that is being done is just to police and manage and, um, and, Mm-hmm. count the la e count the, the every every sort of life droplet that they can uh yeah. from the worker so this whole mm-hmm. um, language is even right it's something that is consistently showing up uh um, yeah where we're talking about farmers yeah yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I, i'm also really like say, oh i'm sorry yeah, um, go ahead i would say that yeah to your point better shay like um you know, the the enslaved population were promised, you know, land and a mule, you know, whenever, you know, they were set free. And, you know, yeah, exactly. And they didn't, you know, they didn't get that. And like, uh, I was just looking at an article and it says that, you know, black farmers owned, you know, millions of millions of farms before, but because of, uh, you know, now now it's like significantly less uh, farms that black, you know, that come from, you know, that there are black farmers. And like, uh, even what they make is like, they make annually like 40,000 versus the white farmers who make 190,000. And part of that is land. So there's no generational land that, ha- that has been passed up, passed down or anything like that. So that that's another point. And they overwork the farms. I mean, I think when we had, uh, when they went straight to corn and straight to soy, it, you you can't, the nutrients don't, of course, Monsanto came in, which may happen in India, right? Probably they'll come in and you they make these seeds so they don't reseed and you have to buy the seeds all over every year mm-hmm. um and, and i've i guess that's i guess that's the biggest issue is that it is going to be the the country is going to give up any kind of um money i guess from farming but at the same time how much do they really make i mean these private corporations seem to be able to make a shit ton of money doing this but yeah. for some reason, the government can't figure it out. I mean, that's not shocking, but it, you know, maybe they could hire someone <laughs> to help them figure that out. Because I think we have the same problem with hoarding. I mean, you saw everybody at the toilet paper shop, right? We get all the stuff we can and we keep it for ourselves, us, us, us. I just, and yeah, that's the caste system right there. And I'm up at the top and I understand that, you know, it's, it is what it is, unfortunately. I sound like Donald Trump. Meh, 300,000 deaths. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. really I'm also really understand. interested in thinking about how, like, indigeneity and belonging to the land fits into this picture, right? Mm-hmm. These are folks yeah. who have been on land for generations and generations, have certain kinds of relationships to it. Mm-hmm. Susie, like you were saying, like, have particular kinds of knowledge about what crops and when and how and how to extract and all of that good stuff. And yeah, like imposing like a logic of productivity onto these folks feels a certain kind of way and intersects with like indigeneity and belonging to the land in really Mm -hmm. interesting ways that I'm still thinking through. Well, just because I happen to know this, (laughs) not for any other reason, but I just heard it. Apparently, if you grow hemp, it is a natural uh, uh, way to reinvigorate the land. And it's a cash fucking crop. And you can make anything out of it. There's in Asheville, there's an entire house made out of hemp. I mean, you can make it into any textile. You can make it into bricks. That somebody out there also had a car in North Carolina with a what was made out of hemp. And it it's just it's I don't understand what the problem is here other than cotton and oil. Those are the big ones that are keeping us from using from from using hemp as a revitalizing method for i mean we just got the 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 right to grow hemp in texas and it's not it, we're not doing it we're afraid re- of it Pe- petroleum 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 it makes everything plastic houses na- i mean everything but are there restrictions the same thing. Yes. are there restrictions on hemp we did, and in fact, right right this is very funny um we were there was a it was on the floor, I think it was on the house, and one of the, the house members said, how can we make sure that hemp won't be abused the mm. way 
marijuana is. And I was like, what are they going to make too many t-shirts? Yeah. You can't abuse yeah. hemp. I mean, it's a textile. You don't smoke hemp. Nobody smokes hemp. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It makes no sense to me. <laughs> so sorry, that was my... That no, was my pro cannabis. <laughs> it was awesome because it, it allows me to do this segue to bring it back to the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when the British first started the Virginia colony, it was dying. It was going nowhere. It was just dying. And what happened was John Rawl figured out a way to basically make tobacco marketable. So they did that. And all of a sudden, Virginia is making crazy money because the English literally marketed a a substance they knew was an addictive narcotic that killed you. By the, by the 1580s, the British were actually already having published articles talking about how tobacco lowered your life expectancy and made you sick regularly. And so in the 1520s, Britain launches an ad campaign 40, four decades later on their own population to intentionally addict their own population to make Virginia work. They get it to work, right? The world's first ever drug dealer empire successfully takes off and the Virginia colony begins to expand. The problem is, is tobacco, like cotton, wrecks the soil and they didn't have the technology at the time to avoid that. Like today, obviously you can grow tobacco and cotton on the same piece of land because we have all these different fixes, but they didn't at the time. So the way they, the way they solved it was drong nach vest. I mean, uh, manifest destiny, but they didn't call it that yet. Drang nach Ost was the Nazi thing. I always get those confused. Well, Manifest Destiny is pretty close. With manifest Destiny, <laughs> the same goddamn thing to the point where mm -hmm. Hitler actually said, we're going to do to Poland and Russia what the United States did to North America. So um, what we would do is we, we would wreck the soil. We had frontiersmen on the frontier slaughtering the Native Americans, stealing their farms. And then we would then go buy those farms from the frontiersmen and turn them over to tobacco and cotton. And then a new generation of frontiersmen would go west. They would, they would slaughter the Native Americans, steal their farms, and then the plantations would just keep moving west behind the frontiers. Well, eventually, they ran into the Appalachian Mountains. And it, there's great farmland on the other side, but it belonged to France. And Washington, George Washington, his family had made all this money off of tobacco, but in the process wrecked their soil. And what they needed to do was get on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains but that was French territory. And so he was stuck growing hemp. Oh, darn it. And he hated growing <laughs> hemp. He wanted to grow tobacco because he wanted to use slave population to grow a product that killed its customers, wrecked the soil, and forced you to kill Native Americans to steal their land to continue his way of life. While killing the enslaved population. While murdering the enslaved population by literally working them to death or, or executing them or torturing them. And so, so basically we had this crazed drug dealer dude who, who, who like, like a locust, wants to expand west and he starts the Seven Years' War to, to try and steal Kentucky from France. And in the end, they, 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 it's a long story, but they, they, they don't get it. They don't get Kentucky from France because even though the British take Kentucky, they, ha they hand it over to Native Americans instead of to the tobacco farmers. And that's why we do our revolution. Our revolution was an attempt to expand slavery west of the Appalachian Mountains. It was not an attempt to liberate the United States in any way, shape, or form. Our revolution existed uh, strictly to, to expand slavery to west of the Appalachian Mountains and to make it so that Yankee mer merchants could produce finished goods. So it was so that rich Yankees could get richer and rich Southerners could expand slavery. And that's, that's what we did. World George War II bands. Didn't he have like a really close relationship with Lafayette or somebody? Well, I mean, like General Lafayette comes because Franklin talks the French into joining the revolution, which wasn't a revolution in any way, shape or form. It was a civil war. But, you know, the Boston okay. massacre wasn't a massacre. It was a mass <laughs> shoot. So... We're, 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 bowling, are you talking about the Bowling Green Massacre? Oh, the Bowling Green Massacre, which oh, I just lament the fact that it happened. It's so sad. <laughs> Don't we all? So many thousands of nobodies actually died, and it was tragic. <laughs> it um, really was. So World War II ends. Okay. And, and we decide we're going to replace Great Britain and France. Mm -hmm. the, our goal, it doesn't really become solidified until Eisenhower, but it's, it's basically the Eisenhower Doctrine. 
the Eisenhower Doctrine, his first goal, his first order of business is to destroy the French and British empires and then replace them with the United States Empire. His second issue is to, to fight communism. Destroying Britain and France was before fighting communism. His third goal was to prevent the Arabs from unifying. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because it's actually at the core of what Modi's doing right now in India. <clears throat> The tragedy of post-colonial world for the United States was almost every single state came out socialist. Every single state came out with, an, with, the, with the expressed intention of liberating their people. And, and here is the United States whose goal it is to exploit labor everywhere around the world and exploit resources and we're trying to replace the British and French empires, but we're running into states like the Arab Republic of Egypt or the newly independent India, which, which are trying to go their own way and they create the non-alignment pact, right? And the non-alignment pact ends up with more members than NATO and Warsaw Pact combined and really gives the United States a run for its money. But in the end, we win. The United States defeats the non-alignment pact uh, it, I think it still exists on paper, but obviously it doesn't exist in reality anymore. <laughs> and and the, and the Arab attempt at unification to create a, a, a secular socialist state is destroyed. And the, here's, here's what it boiled down to. This is what the neoliberalists, neoliberals realized. If we could promote tyranny around the world and interrupt democracy wherever we could, we could do a cultural revolution in these countries that were defying us. So for example, take Egypt, because it was a wild US success. So the, the belief in the, for, the upper middle class, for the upper class in Egypt was that Egypt couldn't be modernized because the people by their very nature were socialists. So if, you, if, if you're poor, your family members sent you money. If you needed a job, a rich family member got you a job. If you lived in an apartment complex, all the people in the apartment building with you would take care of you if you got sick. That, that, that by, there, was a, there was a total social network for like social security. It's just, it wasn't government run. It was the Egyptian people doing it for each other. And what the, what the upper class, the Fulu believed was that the only way to modernize Egypt was to, to, to break that socialist spirit and replace it with this neoliberal panic, right? Where you're constantly scared about losing your job. You're constantly on edge. You don't have enough money. You can't quite pay the rent. You can't quite buy your food. Because the belief was, is that kind of panic would force you to work hard. Scarcity mindset. It, mindset the scarcity mindset would get you focused on what you didn't have. You would work super hard. And then they could extract your labor and pay you nothing for it. It's just white supremacy sort of, uh, yeah. And, and Nasser and Nehru and Tito represented this faction of three newly independent states. Yugoslavia is complicated, but right, it was created after World War I, so it totally fits that. Um, these three states that decided to defy this, this neoliberal... Fascism. Uh, <laughs> yeah, basically. But also at the same time, it decided to, to defy uh, Soviet-style communist tyranny as well. And in the process, they, they have lots of crazy successes, but Egypt goes down in a ball of flames, the Six-Day War, the death of Nasser. They, he gets replaced by Sadat. And Sadat is kind of like Modi in so many ways. And one of the ways that he was like Modi, what he did was he began to systematically sell off state assets. And he created a sort of crony capitalist Egypt, where instead of having the state intervene in, in agriculture, for example, instead of having the state intervene in, in factory production, uh, you know, it's just some friend of a friend who now runs that factory. And he, it would also sell off assets to foreigners, just because he realized the more foreigners you got into the system, the harder it was. There was no loyalty, right? It's the reason why you hire mercenaries, because it they don't like care about the people. It sounds like exactly what we do, only, you know, not as, uh, it, it's that light. <laughs> we're neoliberalist lights right now because I think we're all scared. We're afraid of, we've got the scarcity 
issue. We don't, we're not all have jobs. We don't all have jobs. A lot of us are terrified. We're going to, I mean, especially after this quote unquote stimulus check. Right. I mean, it, it relates that story relates or the, or the, the tale relates to me um, on that. Of course, it's not nearly as awful. We have Netflix and ice cream can be delivered, but it, I can see it doing the same thing. Um, I, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do here about that. I, it just seems like we're expanding the same things we've always done rather than, I mean, we're trying to scare each other into doing something we want the other to do. <laughs> yeah. We need a general strike, right? We need like yes. a general strike. Um, because I mean, what's it going to take for, you know, Americans need to get, be in the streets, you know, um, Damn right. Because I mean, this $600 is, like laughable on all sides to even to bring that up and then we've had, you know people was like well the democrats you know we're pushing for more but like we Nancy Pelosi said this is substantial amount for money for people so there's problems on both sides you know what i mean so but why did trump yeah. come in and veto that and say i want two thousand dollars this is not like him it's this crazy. is not him it's and he's it was not Richard who suggested the six hundred dollars and he yeah. can't possibly think that i mean he's not a man to give away money so he's really trying to hurt the republicans it feels to me like he's really trying to hurt all. Uh, one of the things about trump is he's random right he's blo yeah. he's going one direction suddenly he turns around he's going the other direction he reverses himself three times in the same sentence yeah. so so i think trying to understand him is is not useful i yeah. I, I don't think trump knows what trump is trying to achieve but it, but it's really amazing because this was his policy. <laughs> you don't think Bannon stepped in and said you should do this? I mean, because I don't think Trump would have ever thought of this on his own. He would have been so excited to have to be the stimulus man, you know, that hey, we did this. It's another thing that I did for you. It just doesn't. It, this does not seem like Trump. This seems like Bannon saying listen, you want to, you need to tell these Republicans that you're here to stay. And so is our new party. Well, I mean, with the first stimulus though, he, he wanted it to go out with his name signature in there. Right. So yeah. they wouldn't put me past it where he's like, well, we're going to send out new checks, but this time I'm going to have my face on it. Yeah. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. He could have, you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. Cause he's totally random dude. So we don't know. <laughs> yeah. so I don't know. He's quite Which brings us to another really important lesson. Mm -hmm. that, that, that I think uh, the world has sort of taught, or the United States has taught the world, maybe the United States learned it on its own. So Piketty wrote the book Capital in the 21st Century. And one of the things that Piketty tried to do is describe a time when you could work hard and become rich. And what he concluded was, in all the economic data that he looked at, there has never been a time or a place where you could work hard and become rich that's he actually basically says the only way you become rich in human history is you're born to it or you marry into it those are your two options he said with the exception of 1948 to 1973 in the united states for a 25 year span in the human experience you could work hard and become rich if you were white and male right right to be clear just so we're clear <laughs> Well, we're it, talking it, about also, people who count, right? There's exceptions to this rule, right? As a general rule, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. I mean, you I, can I point to Carnegie. Who, yeah, yeah. As, as those who... No, are like, so everybody's always, saying, Carnegie? Yeah. yeah Name yeah. somebody else. Ah, uh, <laughs> Carnegie. <laughs> and then the story ends. Um, so, <laughs> what happened in that 25 years span of time, 1948 to 1973? The United States is only ever true revolution. And I, according to the NAACP, the civil rights movement went 1954 to 68. Now, I, I argue that those dates aren't exactly right, but, but they're, they're really useful because that 14 years add 69. That 15 years was the United States' only true revolution. We, we flipped this country upside down economically, culturally, and politically. Now, it ends up failing in large measure because the, the baby boomers got co-opted and they got sucked into the system. But, but nonetheless, there were major reforms that, that we're still living with today that, that were useful and wonderful, and you'd be kind of foolish to throw those out with the bathwater. Right. So that's a, that was a disaster. The United States never wanted that. 
And so the lesson that was learned that Reagan implemented, that's the Reagan revolution, is we need to re-impoverish the American population. We need to destroy the United States' economy. Because if we leave the economy intact and people aren't scrambling to find rent checks and food checks, then they have time to think about what social justice looks like. And the next thing you know, we're gonna have another 60s. How do we prevent another 60s? Let's peasantize the economy. Let's, let's render the American public into this, this lower- Hey Roy, we call them gig workers now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly what we've done. Nobody has, 50% of the US population now doesn't have a job. They're yeah. gig workers, <laughs> they're self-employed. Whatever the hell that is. I got a I got an Uber job on the side. There's a teacher, a full time teacher, who's driving Uber just so she can <sighs> make ends make, meet, and that's that's one person. I can't think of all of the people who's who are being evicted. I mean, did they put the moratorium on? I heard they may have put it on for another six weeks, but I don't know if that was part of the package that was vetoed. Hmm. Well, it wasn't vetoed. It was pocket vetoed. Okay. What? I'm sorry. I don't know. So, <laughs> so this is constitutional. So for the record, it's just a weird thing that's in the constitution. But you know, Madison admitted after the constitutional convention that a lot of the stuff that got into the constitution, like the way we select the president, was not thought through. <laughs> it was probably a mistake, but they yeah. were in a rush. And so they, they, just, they just started passing stuff. Well, one of the things that's in the constitution is the president has the right to sign a bill or veto a bill, or ignore a bill. If the president chooses to ignore a bill, the president has 10 days minus Sundays, so it's either 11 days or 12 days, depending on how many Sundays you run into, to sign a bill. If he doesn't sign or veto the bill by the end of the 11 or 12 days, and Congress is still in session, then the bill die, and then the bill becomes the law as if he signed it. If Congress is no longer in session, then the bill dies and, and falls into a, a vacuum. And it's, we call it a pocket veto, but it's not accurate way to think of it because a, po a veto can be overridden. There's no way to override a pocket veto. It's, it just, the bill just went poof. <laughs> it's gone. Wow. And that's what he did. He just, he, he didn't sign it. He didn't veto it. The 10 days expired, Congress wasn't in session, and so the bill vaporized. Uh, um, God, what an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and it's genius because you can't override it with a veto override. Like, That's fascinating. I, I had no idea about that. That, well, that was something I did not know. That's well, why they you. have to come back tomorrow and do this again. And, and Nancy Pelosi has said she's gonna do the $2,000 amount. Oh, great, so it'll never happen. Well. But, it, Biden. but isn't that genius then? You can use COVID to knock the American public down a whole nother notch. God. And I would say, look, I mean, I'm no, I don't necessarily hate her, but I don't think that uh, Pelosi, I think she's a fucking brilliant chess player. And I personally think she's better at, at it than Mitch McConnell, but she's also not a hundred percent on the side that I would like her to be on. She's, she's kind of leaning that way, but I feel like, and I've said it before, I think that our Democratic Party right now is uh, the new Republican Party, and mm -hmm. we're just going to slide off, and, and I, we're going to have to create a new party. It's going to have to be a progressive party, and we're going to have to start it with a big wave, not just a couple of people. I mean, we have yeah. to get on the ballots, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the Republican Party is going to, I think, become QAnon. Or something yeah. like that. <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, like I, like I was saying um, before, that uh, we saw the Tea Party, right? They ushered in this new wave of kind of politics on their end, and they got their Donald Trump, you know what I mean? And now a lot of them are mad and angry, like, no, Donald Trump didn't lose. So they're doing the same thing that the Democrats did for four years, you know what I mean? Oh, Trump didn't win because of Russia and yeah. Moscow. Yeah, we had Moscow mad out on every night, you know what I mean? <laughs> Talking yes. about this. And then... Um, and then now we have that, that Trump's gonna, not going to be in office anymore. We have the Proud Boys to do the same thing for four years. You know what I mean? They're going to keep at it and keep They'll at it. They'll build keep it at up. It. And my, meanwhile, we're on the left 
like taking this, no, you left people. Joe Biden can do whatever he wants. How dare you criticize him? The midterms are coming up tomorrow. <laughs> you can't say anything. So, I mean, we have a lot of, a lot of our folks that are kind of like, yeah, you know, we, got, we kind of just got to push Biden left. But I mean, I think we're seeing that that's not possible. You know what I mean? Yeah. We got, we got to build something else, I think, personally. There can be an inside and outside strategy, but we do got to think, think of an outside strategy. I agree. I agree. And um, we're, we need to wrap up, but I did want to say one thing that I read in the um, DSA newsletter. Um, and it was, a, I guess, an op-ed about being, t about being tired of doing this, of people mm -hmm. just saying, I'm done. I just, yeah. you know, screaming into the void, I'm over it. And that's what I'm afraid. Wait, of. doing that's what? D of standing yes. up for like doing what we're doing like being oh, activists oh. like going yeah. and demanding that we are people are you going to make me are you going to fulfill all your promises yeah. are you going to make me you know that's the we have to make them and if they yeah. don't we've got to get them out and the the new right is terrifying to me if, if if this party of Trump, if we can't get our own party going of progressives, and I'm all for AOC starting that up, you know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people would follow along with her and her her group, her squad, but yeah. something so is, has to happen. <laughs> so is Nashville the start of the the little terror thing we were suspecting is going to happen? Were there, was there any more news on that? What happened or who? I mean, last I heard, rent? they think the guy, it was a suicide attack and the guy blew himself up in the RV. Uh, um, I think that, that it is the beginning. Absolutely. I do. I don't and then think there were, Now there's a shooting in Illinois at a bowling alley. It's not oh, going to wow. stop. It's a lot just of gonna violence for Christmas and the day after. Yeah. And as we get closer to certification and the actual inauguration i'm i'm a little i'm glad there aren't going to be millions of people at the inauguration because i don't know that, that scares me too like you know it doesn't i saw a show once where this guy goes to a, a stadium and he blows bubbles and he sees where the bubbles go and it's because he's trying to see what would happen if he loosed anthrax or something in the air just to see how far it would go wow. you know and those kinds of things terrify me wow. I you could know. walk in and do that. Yeah. In 1953, Eisenhower did his inauguration parade in New York City in a convertible. No. And people threw ticker tape. And then Kennedy did a, uh, a drive-by. <laughs> How quickly that changed. <laughs> and yeah. Reagan and the Pope. Remember the Pope Mobile? Yeah. <laughs> With his glass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's encased in glass. <laughs> uh huh. So we're, oh my gosh! Go ahead. I think we're are we running out of time? Should we? We are. Yeah, we are. But we... please, if you have something, let's no, no, do no. It and... I was yeah, just okay. gonna say maybe we can go around and say um, one last thought. Okay. Why don't you start? Ha. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I think this uh, conversation for me has what stood out is just this um, this move towards a, a mindset of domination um, that it's that's that it's always been around um, but that it's become more and more systematized um, and it's moved into it's it's become a uh, a way of life that manages us more and more, um, and yeah, and almost everywhere we look, that's what we see. <laughs> yeah, more and yeah. more. Mm -hmm. Roy, peace. You got anything to close out with? Um, I hope that, you know, like the, the farmers movements and, you know, the stories about Haiti uh, can inspire folks to, you know, stay active, you know, of course, take those breaks, uh, you know what I mean? Enjoy your families during this holiday break. Uh, but yeah, try to stay engaged, try, try to do what you can, you know what I mean? There's like, like uh, Nina Turner says, you know, there's a place for everyone in the, in the revolution. Mm -hmm. Find your place, do what you can. If, if that's just mm -hmm. retweeting something, retweet it. If it's just, you know, Facebook and it's in an article, do that. You know what I mean? There's a place for everyone. Uh, just be inspired. Um, stay safe. 
wear a mask, social distance. <laughs> Ramesh? Yeah, I think we really messed up when we went from hunter-gatherers to, to starting that farming. <laughs> I think that's where the domination started, right? Yeah. Put something in the earth, manage it, cultivate it, save up for next year and the year after that. Uh, pay the folks who are managing it in a certain kind of way. All of a sudden, we have currency. All of this stuff goes on after that. So, you know, let's let's, let's go back. <laughs> mm -hmm. Moving backwards. I like that. <laughs> uh, Mr. Roy War, what have you got? <laughs> uh, so, the, uh, Ramesh asked a question, which was, uh, if there has ever been a successful... Um, people's uprising and the answer is there 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 have been but you need to be careful with the how you look at it time frame wise so for example the 60s d definitely changed our relationship to gender and race and sexuality and you know like how we looked at uh, homosexuality all of that even if it took decades to unfold so um what was it? What was the Obama quote? Our children now believe mm -hmm. the, the things that we taught them, even if we didn't. E even if we don't believe it. it we taught them something. Yeah. And they've come to believe it. Yeah. 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 And so, 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 mm -hmm. you know, in that way, I think the 60s was a success. Uh, 1848 uprising, uprisings, there was, there was a glorious success out of that. And that was Norway, the kingdom of Sweden, Norway. And, you know, I think when we think of Sweden and Norway today, we think of two pretty idyllic societies. Um, and then the, the Arab Spring produced Tunisia. Tunisia has a fragile democracy, but it's holding on. It's somehow making this work. Um, so even though I think 90% or 98% of what happened in the Arab Spring can, is a wash and it was lost. Um, and then also I, I think even if it didn't last initially, India's uh, separation from Great Britain was was a brilliant success. Uh, the, the reason I think it didn't last has been this rise of the right and the BJP and their their uh, fascist neoliberal agenda, which is disassembling what India built. I mean, India was the hope for the third world. The third world looks to India and goes, oh my God, that, that's what we want. And Modi is completely disassembling all of that. I mean, to the, to the extent to which the first thorium nuclear reactor ever operated on Earth was done by India. India has sent a robotic mission to Mars. I mean, India is even, even doing tech. India, India is a shattered dream. Um, but, but for a few decades, it was, it was inspiring. Wow. I mean, yeah. Yeah, let's not, I mean, you know. If the farmers pull this off, this shatter. Yeah, I mean, shatter. Fuses back together a little yeah, bit. Yeah, shatter might be a little. Uh, the BJP's. <laughs> one step forward, two steps back. Sometimes right forward, you know, it's, it's just, it's just iterations. And, and that's why I think people get so tired of it. You know, you make these, you make these great strides and then someone like Trump comes along and just with a stroke or a very long, bizarre signature, and uh, it's all gone, you know? Is it all gone, though? But I, I also think Trump taught it's us a peril. lot of really good lessons. I, I think what Trump really did was he ripped the, the, the wrapping around the package, and now we see it's, it's a maggot-infested thing. But that was just because we were refusing to look. Yeah. <laughs> you could hear them in there. Oh, Merry Christmas! Yeah. <laughs> let's just let's just hope he unleashes the the story about UFOs. He releases Julian Assange and never snows any part of them. Oh <laughs> right? my God! Reality winner. <laughs> Reality and and the uh, the Kennedy stuff. You know, hopefully that comes out of the package as well. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, he did release the story about the UFOs. You, ha you didn't see the interviews with the Navy. I actually did. That's, yeah, I did yeah. see some of that. <laughs> that was incredible. That was uh -huh. pretty crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that was that was insane, and we're crazy to think we're the only ones around in this in this universe. I am embarrassed though if they're watching us. You know. What oh I mean? my God! Yeah. <laughs> like they're oh, laughing. Crap. There's tune oh, in. I tune in for it as the as the world turns. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, they are laughing and yeah. and it's good that we can laugh occasionally too we're trying to keep our our spirits up right and joke mm. about some of the some of the stuff that's not as horribly serious <laughs> yeah but I think it's important to keep our sense of humor, um, but also continue to be very engaged in some of the stuff that is not funny uh, and, and bring it to light however we can. If it's a meme, like you guys said, uh, Roy, you know, whatever, a tweet, just continue to stay engaged is, is I'm, that's my biggest message for 2021 and, and following because just because Biden won, that does not mean we are okay. That, that is not that is not okay. <laughs> Biden winning has done is allowed white people to feel comfortable with all the crap in the United States. <laughs> That's right. hundred percent. Yeah. And there is that saying like black folks say, Hey, we've been experiencing this for, for decades. You know, it's now that now white folks have finally felt the brunt of yeah. something in America and now they're, they're mad. Well <laughs> and look at how quickly it changed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And for we the got... white people in the group, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay exactly. you guys this has been fun i hope y'all have a wonderful day thanks for tuning in and listening and uh we will be up on youtube pretty quick rpm and uh we'll have a, a an audio podcast coming out soon uh of this episode so thanks a lot everybody Bye. 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 Stay happy, happy. <laughs>